so moving the focus away from skilling uh, in the current conversation to what has been one of the most hard hitting headlines that we have to grapple with in the recent few in the recent past uh, all of us have seen very disturbing pictures of uh, millions of migrants uh, having to take the long road back to their home uh, we're specifically talking about rural development here the number of livelihoods that have been lost uh, the number of people who have had to grapple with homelessness uh, the number of people who have to grapple with uh, question marks around sustained recurring incomes uh, in the months to come until the sort of job market resumes itself so there are several questions uh, but one hopes to find answers uh, in the months to come and today we have with us uh, three experts from very diverse perspectives who have joined us today to provide their own unique vision and history of how they have seen things evolve uh, in the last several years uh, of i mean since independence and what does their vision look like uh, in the years to come uh, we begin today with uh, shrimati rajeshri birla ji uh, who is joined us today who has been very gracious to join us today on video uh, but we will be playing one of our recorded videos as uh, she is not keeping well but thank you so much ma'am for taking the time out to join us uh, a little bit of history as most of us in india would know and probably this is for some parts of the international audience uh, the birla family in india has uh, been extremely and deeply involved across three generations uh, of in philanthropy uh, very deeply entrenched in rural development work and community centric work for several decades now dating back as early as 1800s uh, starting with mr gd birla uh, a lot of work deep investment specifically targeted at the most vulnerable and the most marginalized in the interiors of india given the context of covid uh, we would like to take a step back and hear from shrimati rajeshri billa herself on how the definition uh, and philanthropy has evolved over successive decades uh, in the last several years and what is her vision and and the community's uh, sort of center for community and rural development's vision for the next few years over to you akshay to play shrimati rajeshri's video good afternoon i feel humbled to have been asked by the naj foundation to share a narrative of philosophy throw some light on our foundation's work its focus areas a helicopter view of how we engage uplift and empower the underprivileged in india and the way forward the move towards an india where freedom from poverty becomes a dream come true the very beginning it all goes back to over 150 years rooted in history at that point in time philanthropy as a conscious act featured nowhere in the mankind's lexicon however doing good has always and continues to be at the core subconsciously for many way back in 1800s the billa family began its journey on the road to philanthropy with the setting up of dharmshalas goshalas and temples then spirituality was the driving factor by early 1900s the billa family began taking a keen interest in education in 1918 our family established the first high school in pilani in fact what started as a small school in pilani evolved into a unique university under the tutelage of my grandfather in law shri ghanshyam das ji birla today bits pilani is a non parallel temple of learning a tribute to his vision of true education with him at the helm of the family the act of giving became even more pronounced dauji as we all fondly called him was greatly influenced by the father of our nation mahatma gandhi they developed a special bond between the mahatma and dauji between the two there was immense mutual admiration under gandhiji's influence dauji felt that his wealth was to be used to assist every endeavor of gandhi ji 
he financed the entire freedom struggle. In Gandhiji, he found a leader who only thought of the needs of others and not of himself. Baguji's giving for a cause and for the man he looked upon as an icon. And he gave wholeheartedly because he believed in the power of education. He was religion agnostic as long as the cause deserved his mind space and wallet share. Daviji believed in the trusteeship concept of management, which was espoused by Gandhiji. This meant that a part of your profits be always ploughed back towards meaningful welfare-driven activities aimed at the larger good of society. This has transitioned to a generational legacy. Today, the culture of caring and giving is embedded in our work ethos. With my husband, Adityji, the concept of giving took an additional turn. Adityji subscribed to the adage, if you give a hungry man this one day, he will eat it, and the next day he will be starving again. Instead, if you teach him to fish, he will never go hungry during his lifetime. So he gave generously of his wealth to enable people become self-reliant and eke out a living. A little aside, I vividly recall a conversation between Adityji Kumar Mangalam, my son, and me, where he made a profound statement, which is at in our soul. Adityji said, I believe that it is in giving that we receive. Over the last two decades, Kumar Mangalam took ethos, philanthropy to next level. He institutionalized the spirit of giving and caring for the marginalized in our group. He set up the Aitabilla Center for Community Initiatives and Rural Development. It is a highly professional setup, which I am privileged to chair. The center, with our oversight, provides the strategic direction and the thrust areas for our group's CSR work, ensuring performance management as well. Our vision is to actively contribute to the social and economic development of the underserved communities lifting the burden of poverty and helping bring an inclusive growth. In so doing, build a better sustainable way of life for the weaker sections of society and raise the country's human development index. Our projects are focused in five critical areas. These are healthcare, education, sustainable livelihood, infrastructure development, and social reform. Our goals are aligned with the UNSDGs. We work in 7,000 villages and reach out to 9 million people. Our 20 hospitals and 5,000 medical camps, coupled with mobile medical vans, cater to the healthcare needs of a million Indians. In all humility, we have played a significant role in polio eradication in India, admirably supported by the Ministry of Health, Rotary International, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, among others, in the villages that we work in. Our endeavor is to ensure 100% immunization and institutional deliveries besides our healthcare benefits. At our 56 schools, over 45,000 children receive quality education. A large number of them are first-time learners and tribals. Alongside, we promote the girl-child and support differently able children as well. Likewise, over 100,000 rural folks, along with 45,000 women, constituting over 4,000 self-help groups eke out a decent living through our vocational training programs towards marking 
lives a little more easy, we have set up hundreds of infrastructure projects. In the domain of social reform, we impress upon villagers to take on family responsibilities, preach against alcoholism, child marriages, and women abuse. A key message I would like to share here relates to the girl child where we try to convince people that a daughter is as good as a son. Of course, what we do is a drop in the ocean, but I think it counts. Moving on to today's unbelievable environment, COVID-19, as you know, it is having a devastating effect. The damage it has caused across nations is immeasurable. Our government is working hard to patch the development to pieces. The choice between saving lives and saving livelihoods is an excruciating one. Our government has initiated a slew of reforms. Particularly notable is the sharp focus on the rural ecosystem and the MSMEs besides the relief measures for the marginalized. The pandemic has battered our economy. We need to push incomes and job growth. The onus lies on the private sector and the public sector. The government is seed of the issue. In this environment, Prime Minister Shinarendra Ji Modi's Atmanirbhar Bharat scheme to drive the economy on the road to self-sustenance assumes great significance. As the PM hours, policies have to be laser focused on unleashing the growth potential of India. Taking cognizance of the aspect, special attention is on unshackling the growth of MSMEs. However, we have to bear in mind that growth processes may not be able to include all sectors. Collectively, then the private sector and the government must stand committed to benefits percolating down to the last standing man. Handicrafts promoting eco-friendly bamboo crafts, textiles, particularly handlooms, and social forestry are some sectors favored by rural artisans. These must be prepared for exports as well. Yet another point that I would like to press upon is that quality education and digital access are must-have in the villages. There are good levelers. The National Education Policy 2020 is indeed transformative. NEP is committed to raising public expenditure in education to 6% of GDP. Quite a portion will go to the interiors, hopefully. This will change the scenario to a great extent. On the rural front, the agri-infrastructure funds are rupees 1 lakh crore to develop marketing infrastructure, entailing storage facilities, processing, and logistics is a forward step boosting the rural economy. It would lead to a reaffirmation process, bringing in sustainable yield improvements through scientific farming practices, better price realization, and more. That would uplift the status of farmers and our rural interiors. The pandemic has more than underscored the criticality of having a robust healthcare system. The Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy estimates that for our 1.3 billion population, there are only 1.9 million hospital beds, 95,000 ICU beds, and 48,000 ventilators, which are hopefully short of our country's need. This makes the healthcare system very vulnerable. Like what we face today, our doctor-patient ratio is abysmal. Hospitals are few and far between. All this has to change dramatically. We need thousands of doctors, nurses, 
and medical technicians. For this, we need more medical colleges, which necessitates policy changes. Furthermore, a healthy public-private collaboration in the medical field and far higher spends are the need of the hour. I recently read Dr. Ilaban Bhar's article, and in totality, in different frame, she says, and I quote, we begin by investing in three basic needs of people, food, water, and shelter, and provide three primary basic services, healthcare, education, and banking, that people and societies need for their well-being. By focusing on these six needs and services, we can make sure that our post-pandemic society is both sustainable and equitable. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for your words of wisdom. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out as well. I, I hope you're feeling better. Would you like to say a few words, if that is possible? Uh, I think my speech was quite long, so people must be already tired of hearing it. But it, oh, was, yes. it was a joy for me to join in. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Very gracious of you. Thank you so much. Moving on to our uh, next speaker, uh, we have uh, Dr. A.K. Shivakumar, leading development economist uh, in India, who has joined us. Uh, Professor A.K. Shivakumar is a development economist and policy advisor who works on issues related to human development, poverty, health, nutrition, basic education, and the rights of women and children. He is the co-chair of the No Violence in Childhood, a global learning initiative, and a visiting professor at the Ashoka University, the Indian School of Business, and the Howard Kennedy School. It's my pleasure to welcome you, Professor A.K. Shokumar, and uh, the floor is all yours for you to lend your perspectives on, on rebuilding lives in India. So, uh, thank you so much, and uh, welcome to all of you. Good evening. Uh, it's always a good occasion to talk about rebuilding lives across rural India. And today is a particularly good occasion being Independence Day, uh, because for all of us, independence is synonymous with freedoms. So when we talk about rebuilding lives, especially after the destruction being caused by the COVID pandemic, this is indeed a good opportunity to talk about the things we need to do to expand people's freedoms across rural India. It is a good opportunity to reflect on what needs to be done to enhance the security in the lives of people in rural India. I'll divide my presentation into three parts. First, I'd like to begin by making four observations on the use of the term rural itself. Next, I want to flag four critical areas for invigorating rural India. And finally, I want to list, end by listing four areas of hope that I see for the future. Let me then start by making four observations on the use of the term rural. First, it's useful to remind ourselves what a rural area is. Uh, I think some of you may know, uh, we classify areas into rural or urban using a definition that, has, that was adopted by the census of India. And according to the census, all areas which are not categorized as urban are considered to be rural areas. Uh, now that asks uh, that then we ask the question what is an urban unit and according to the census it includes all places with a municipality corporation cantonment and all urban units and there are three criteria that are used a minimum population of 5000 at least 75 percent of the male main workers are engaged in non-agricultural pursuits and a density of population of at least 400 per square kilometers so in other words, a rural area is one which has a population of less than 5,000, where less than 25% of men are engaged in non-agricultural pursuits, and where the population density is less than 400 per square kilometer. The second observation following from this, let us not forget that this definition of census was adopted in 1971, uh, 50 years ago. 
Uh, the question then to ask is to what extent does this spatial definition capture rural urban divides? Uh, to just give you one example, take access to electricity. Uh, some of you would, might have seen the night maps put out by NASA and Google. In these maps, uh, the brightest areas of the Earth at night are considered to be the most urbanized. And if you look at the night map of India, and I would seriously suggest that you should, uh, you will be in for a surprise uh, because it will appear as if almost two thirds of India is urban, as opposed to what the census of India tells us that two thirds of India is rural. This leads me to my third observation that the common perception has been that rural areas lack basic amenities. Uh, many of you will recall, this was why President Kalam, when he spoke about rural development, advocated for Pura, which he called provision of urban amenities to rural areas. And if we go by this notion of development, rural India has indeed changed dramatically in terms of access to goods and services needed for decent living, access to roads, access to electricity, as I mentioned, access to banking services, and so on. We are told today that almost 100% of India's habitations are connected to a road. Rural India has become 100% ODF for open defecation free. And very soon we will not find any difference. In any case, we should not find any difference in the amenities available in rural areas and urban areas. The convergence between rural and urban areas in terms of provisioning of services is unfortunately not, not something that we can term as development. We have to judge development using the lens of freedoms, equity, and social justice. And the social divides in both urban and rural areas remain wide. And this brings me to my last observation on the term rural, that rural is often used by city walas to denote backwardness. Uh, this is often because many villagers haven't yet been exposed to shopping malls, flyovers, glitzy skyscrapers, fancy five-star hotels, multiplex theaters, and so on. But as I've been talking about this, backwardness should not be linked to incomes or the availability of goods and services. We should be talking about backwardness in social behavior, in backwardness in thinking, and backwardness in mindsets. For example, we know that India's adverse child sex ratio captures the anti-female biases and discrimination against girls and more generally women. But we should also remember that the child sex ratio in urban India is worse than it is in rural areas, suggesting that the son preference or the daughter aversion is much stronger in rural India than in urban India. Again, the COVID pandemic has exposed the mentality of, shock, of city walas. Uh, the treatment meted out to migrant workers has exposed how bloody minded city dwellers are. The way some resident welfare associations treated domestic staff reveals a behavior that is shameful compared to the large heartedness of rural communities. Similarly, how can we accept that so many small businesses and businesses in the cities refuse to look after stranded migrant workers who had been serving them for years and years and years? That city dwellers did not care for how migrant workers lived and served them reveals apathy and indifference that is shocking it reflects an urban backwardness in social attitudes that is very disturbing. So in all these respects, it's very difficult when you look at uh, what is development and how to, how to rebuild rural India. Uh, rural India, in fact, seems to have done fared much better than urban India, and if, especially if we come to climate change, where the destruction of uh, water bodies in cities or felling of trees has been quite rampant. Let me come to the second part of my presentation. Uh, and here I want to stick to the idea of backwardness. Uh, and let me flag what I regard as the four most critical areas for invigorating rural India. The first has to do with greatly expanding the freedoms that women have all over India, but more so in rural India. And let me explain what I mean. Take the population issue. We know that the fertility rates in urban areas is less than two, two is the replacement rate, and in urban areas, it is higher than the replacement rate of two. But many of us do not realize that the rural fertility rates, the fertility rates in rural Andhra Pradesh, rural Himachal Pradesh, rural Tamil Nadu, rural West Bengal, and rural Kerala is lower than the fertility rates in urban Bihar, urban Haryana, urban Madhya Pradesh, urban Rajasthan, and urban Uttar Pradesh. 
This tells us that women's fertility rates do not depend upon where they live, whether they live in rural or urban areas. It really depends on the freedoms that women have to take decisions relating to their fertility. Two questions will help clarify what I'm saying. We have to ask, why is it that when across the country, women in rural area on average want to have less than two children, they end up having 2.5 children? The second question is, why is it that when across the country, 99% of women in rural India know about a modern method of contraception, that is almost 100%, only less than half of them use, are able to use a modern method of contraception. This is because most women, and especially those in rural India, do not have the freedoms to exercise control over fertility decisions. We also know that the population question or fertility rates decline with an increase in the level of women's education. So if it's a mother with the, the fertility rate among mothers with no schooling is three, that is the average number of children is three, whereas among, those, among women or mothers who have had 10 or 11 years of schooling, it is less than two. And we also know that fertility rates decline with an increase in women's paid employment. And this is where the news is in good. India has seen a fall in female labor force participation rates at 23% today, only nine countries, only nine countries in the world report a lower rate of female labor force participation rate than India. And these include Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Somalia, and so on. Let me give you one more example on the importance of women's freedoms. Uh, we all know that close to 38% of India's children under five are stunted. Uh, and this is a shocking figure. Uh, 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 it's among the top 15 countries reporting the highest rates of stunting. And the proportion is much higher, 41% in rural areas and 31% in urban areas. There are, of course, many causes of stunting, but the first clue comes from the fact that almost 20% of babies born in India are of low birth weight. And this flags an important question that children, this actually the low birth weight babies is a manifestation of the intergenerational transfer of undernutrition uh, from the mother to the child. And it really reflects the neglect of both women's health and women's nutrition in India. So, so I want to make my first point that if you want to invigorate rural India, the first priority should be to expand freedoms for women, the freedom to pursue education, the freedom to pursue employment. And this requires investing in creating conditions for decent employment, social security, safety in workplaces, providing safe transportation to work, et cetera. And finally, the freedom to access healthcare and the freedom to exercise rights over reproductive health. And the impacts will be felt not only on the lives of women, but on the lives of children, on the well-being of families and the development of society. This brings me to a second priority and Srimati Birla has already flagged this and it's an extraordinarily important one, uh, which is uh, to talk about universal health coverage. The extraordinary low levels of public spending is, is well known. India spends only about 1.2% of GDP on health, which is the public spending, government spending on health. Uh, the national health policy has said that it should be raised to 2.5% by 2025. It's a very good idea. But the consequences of low public spending are now hitting us in the face. First is that very high out-of-pocket expenditures, private out-of-pocket expenditures, close to 60%. Uh, and this is impoverishing close to 63 million people, uh, Indians every year. And it has become a very tough situation. Uh, the third, and, and by the way, it also tells us now in the COVID pandemic, the, the, uh, the gravity of the situation that it, when we don't have a strong public sector in health. The third priority is, of course, to rebuild, uh, to reinforce social solidarity. Uh, and I think the extraordinary work of the CBOs, NGOs, grassroots organizations, panchayats across states uh, during the pandemic has highlighted how important it is for us to invest in building institutions that strengthen social harmony at the village level. Finally, I want to make one last point, and which is that we have to focus on improving development management. We have, I'm inspired by the large number of young people who are keen to invest in the development sector. But while we have institutions of management catering to businesses, we have very few institutions of management that are investing for improving professional leadership and managers for social purpose organizations. So let me then sum up by what I've been arguing. Uh, we are talking about rebuilding people's lives. Uh, and, uh, we are, uh, and in doing this, I remain hopeful and optimistic. 
I remain hopeful and inspired by the surge in the number of young people keen on working in the development sector. I remain inspired by the power of young girls and women to stand up against injustices and oppression and their will to fight for equality and justice. I remain inspired by the many examples of local community actions that remind us that our social fabric is still strong. Their role in spreading social harmony is inspiring. And finally, I'm inspired by the tradition of public engagement and public discourse that is still intact in many parts of India. Finally, it is only by practicing governance by discussion and governance by listening that we can build an equitable and just society and actually re reinvigorate rural India. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shivakumar. Uh, I would just sort of, sort of would love to respond uh, or, or, or rather I would love to, I would love for Ms. Pallavi to respond um, as a civil servant, as the principal secretary for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes uh, and primarily concerned about their welfare for the government of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, Ms. Pallavi, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this discussion. Uh, if, if Ms. Shokumar, if, if, if you are staying back with us, I uh, would sure. love to hear uh, you know, Pallavi's views uh, on the same, uh, of the picture that you have painted in the past and going forward. Um, hello, everyone. <clears throat> Firstly, I would like to wish everybody who's tuned in a very happy Independence Day. <clears throat> and um, I agree with everything that Shiva has said uh, for wholeheartedly, except to say that uh, his statistics when he talks about rural India and the positivities that you know, rural India, the promise that it holds for us. Um, there's a there's an error, you know, which which comes in which is like, uh, which is basically looking at rural India as one block. And my particular uh, area of work right now after spending long years in public health is uh, the tribal uh, welfare department in Madhya Pradesh. And, um, it, and it's virtually as if in every, uh, you know, uh, uh, indices of, uh, of, 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 of economic and social development, we, uh, in this, for, the, for, for our communities, we are always, playing a game of catching up. So we are um, a, a, couple, a few decades behind, except for the sex ratio of, 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 of girls at birth. So except for that one notable uh, 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 health index outcome index, which uh, has always been positive in tribal communities. So today I'm going to basically, uh, I will not go much into statistics, um, but I will uh, touch upon some broad points as in particular as they relate to the uh, focus which we need to uh, give increasingly to the, um, the most marginalized communities uh, in our society, which is the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribal communities. And, um, and I'm just, just picking up a, a, a small statistic which I saw today in, in an op-ed in the morning was that uh, in terms of wealth, the bottom 10% own 0.2% of wealth in India. And if we were to look into that further disaggregated uh, by community, we will find that tribal communities really have very few productive assets. And such adverse indicators will apply to almost all uh, sort of uh, spheres of social and economic activity, whether it is uh, outcomes like agricultural productivity, or it is processes like the availability of bank branches, the availability of educational institutions, the availability of public health institutions. So in all, whether it is uh, process indicators or it's outcome indicators, we uh, uh, fare rather poorly in tribal communities across the country. So while preparing to sound more knowledgeable for a very erudite audience, I had to, I did quickly look over how are other tribal communities in other states doing. And um, it's, it's a sobering uh, a report to go through. Uh, uh, for anyone who might be interested. Now, uh, traditionally, government has given constitutional safeguards for uh, tribal communities and, and specifically some constitutional safeguards for particularly vulnerable, vulnerable tribal communities, three of which happen to inhabit uh, large parts of Madhya Pradesh. And Madhya Pradesh, in terms of percentages of population which is tribal is amongst the largest in the country. Therefore, a sizable, nearly one fourth of our population of Madhya Pradesh is tribal. And therefore it stands to reason, even from a, from a public uh, finance point of view that commensurate resources must uh, go for, the, for various development needs, whether it is uh, hardcore infrastructure or it is uh, social infrastructure, 
into the progress of these areas which are inhabited by one fourth of our populations. But then what are the problems which uh, happen? So I will just quickly uh, touch, spend a, a few minutes on livelihoods, uh, education and health. Um, in the livelihood sector, typically tribal communities are uh, uh, inhabit forest areas or formerly forested areas. The terrain is inaccessible, uh, still largely inaccessible. Their habitations are sparse. Um, and, uh, and, and this sparsity makes it very hard for us to, uh, to bring them at par with public service delivery in every sphere. And uh, therefore you have uh, low infrastructure penetration in the tribal areas, whether it is uh, hard top roads, whether it is bank branches, whether it is electricity. And now the new divide, which is uh, causing uh, the new divide is the internet um, penetration. So um, a large part of the tribal communities still do not have internet. And, uh, and, and, and now with shrinking forests and loss of traditional livelihoods, uh, providing a sustainable means of livelihood, which is uh, self-sustaining as well as it is endemic or it is in situ growth in the community is really very hard. And government for with all its limitations is not able to bring the market to these communities, which would spur that growth, which is needed. And that is the problem which we faced when we were when we looked at the migrant labor which came back to their villages, because these were low skilled labor traditionally uh, going every year for seasonal uh, livelihoods, but they just came back early. They had just gone and they had to come back. So, um, so there was so we've been struggling with finding adequate uh, avenues to to have them uh, gain fully employed, and uh, that itself has been um, a major issue. That how do we invent? Uh, such programs, how do we invent such avenues in which we can channelize uh, this youth apart from the uh, Narega and uh, the, 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 the regular um, livelihood programs going on. So we have tried to take up some things which are endemic to the uh, regions, uh, for example, uh, minor millets, uh, how do we engage the migrant labor in the cultivation, in expanding the cultivation of migrant uh, of, of millet development, uh, non-timber forest produce, NTFPs, which have been the traditional livelihood source of these communities. Um, we're, we're also trying some new methods of uh, financing by getting um, uh, increased availability of banking correspondence and getting banks to have mobile banking services in these areas to perhaps uh, a pump prime the rural economy. Um, a new thing which government is trying is to leverage art and culture because the intangible heritage of the, of the tribal communities. So to leverage this uh, intangible heritage into something which is marketable as a marketable skill. So let's see how it goes, watch this space and maybe when we meet next time, you can quiz me on uh, you know, how has that worked out. Um, in terms of the education sector, I'll move on because I see that we don't have too much time now. So in terms of the education sector, every process indicator and every outcome indicator, the tribal community is actually much far behind the regular uh, state average and Madhya Pradesh is behind national averages in, in, in educational outcomes. So uh, again, the, the problem of public service delivery, the problem of uh, lack of trained teachers, the problem of uh, adequately staffed schools. It's uh, what, what generally applies to the whole country applies in much more uh, serious fashion to the tribal uh, region schools. Uh, however, uh, the state has invested, I must say over here that the state has been doing something reasonably good, which is to invest in residential schools and vocational training and uh, career development program. So um, that's also something which is uh, which has been given a fillip by the skill development program as it has worked in the last few years. And uh, as well as the development of tribal languages and teaching their textbooks, et cetera, in the local tribal languages, which is uh, already showing signs of better functional literacy and better uptake of languages. This has been around for the last 10, 15 years. And uh, it's just that we are trying to uh, give a larger focus on uh, developing at, uh, appropriate textbooks for uh, tribal children. The problem again remains when uh, because of closed schools 
and lack of internet connectivity, how do I reach most of my children who live in villages who, which do not have internet connectivity and children and families do not have smartphones. They still use QWERTY keyboard, the cheap phone. So, so that remains a sobering thought and it's something which we are actually really struggling with. And I'll be happy uh, uh, if you can, Sri Ram, share my, uh, my, my, my email ID and, and, and get um, help from such development partners or communities who might have figured this out better than we have so far. Uh, one thing which applies to health, you know, I can take uh, the whole of 24 hours of nudge to talk about healthcare in tribal areas, so I will restrain myself on that. But there's a cross-cutting thing which applies to both education and health, which is the community involvement in public service delivery. Now, tribal communities are typically shy and they're typically trusting. And we find that while their aspirations are no less than you or me or, or anybody else, but they do not really uh, get into the ownership of these uh, delivery uh, mechanisms as we would find in say another village largely inhabited by non-tribal communities. So the government has brought out thing, uh, things like differential salaries, higher salary structures, more housing uh, uh, places to have greater retention in tribal areas. But it, it has still left, uh, you know, far, uh, met with limited uh, success. So in, in my view, just to wrap up, because I want to keep some time for, uh, to, uh, for a few minutes for, for questioning. Um, my, so we need to have greater resource infusion. Macro fiscal programming needs to ne uh, meet the aspirations of these communities. And we need to increase the capacity of public service delivery systems to absorb increased outlays. While it is easy to increase outlay, it is very hard to, uh, to use it best. And then we need to have a, rep, uh, a robust regulatory architecture in the social sector which makes sure that the money being spent is being spent well. And lastly, uh, not the least, um, we need evidence-based public expenditure and only last, my family has a concept of only last. We need to engage with youth in whatever we do. If we do not engage with millennials and the next generation, we are, we are going wrong. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. It's, it's, it's something close to my heart and I'll leave it open to you. Thanks, Shiram. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pallavi. We have a few questions, but I'm just going to limit it to two of them. Uh, one for uh, uh, Pallavi yourself and one for Professor Shivakumar. Maybe I'll go to Professor Shivakumar first. And sorry, if you can keep it really brief. I think one of the things is that the it is a, it is a known fact that you know market-based solutions or market-based models uh, are definitely not reaching the bottom you know, 100 million. Uh, and there are other innovative models, disruptions that need to happen in order to truly lift, let's say, the most vulnerable, specifically, let's say, if you take the tribal communities to lift themselves out of poverty. We've had examples of approaches like the graduation approach, which has uh, shown demonstrated evidence globally, multiple contexts and countries. Why has it that, why, why is it not that we've not been able to scale such approaches uh, in the past? And what do you think should be done in order to do that in the future? A uh, very quick answer. I think you hit a very important point that one of the features of India's development sector is that many of the interventions fail, have, been fa have not been scaled up successfully. And so this impacting on scale is a very, very critical uh, 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 problem to crack. And that can be cracked with the use of new technologies, which are now available. And it needs to be cracked by people who have the training. And that's what I was talking about, development management, with the right values or with the knowing skills, with the doing skills, and the, and the ability to combine uh, ma uh, management techniques with complex thinking in the development sector. And I think if we can combine management technology and a vision for the lives, how we want to improve the lives of people and not lose sight of that goal and not reduce it to a techno-managerial exercise, then we, we will really be able to make an impact on scale. Uh, very well, actually that's something, that's two of the things, talent and capital, uh, you know, two levers that we deeply resonate with, at least at the nudge. Uh, quickly moving on to Ms. Pallavi, uh, I think the entire concept of a welfare state, uh, especially catering to the, uh, you know, people at the absolute bottom of the pyramid, uh, for civil society organizations who uh, predominantly uh, uh, you know, bear the burden of serving the most vulnerable in many cases, in many cases very, very successfully as well. 
uh, as a representative of the government, uh, how open are your doors and what would your words of advice be for organizations in terms of working very closely with the government to effect a systemic change? Because ultimately, government is going to be the biggest driver of social change at scale. Uh, so what should they do and not be doing in order to establish a very close working relationship with the government? Um, I'll just take up the quote from uh, Mrs. Birla when she remarked that you uh, teach a person how to fish and you feed them for life. So I think I uh, am not really, I mean, I'm going contrary to, the, to, what, to what happens in the country, but I'm not really a very big fan of... Um, of, of, of the government giving subsidies or or or, or cash handouts and I and 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 uh, community based organizations as I said you know as I mentioned that community processes and ownership of public service delivery unless we fix our governance structure and you know in economics we use the subsidiarity principle and absolutely I mean the local community has to own the development process and we have to give them more voice and more control. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to increase our efficiency. So if I can sum it up in that one sentence, that efficiency cannot come from an unwieldy uh, large public service delivery system. It has to be community owned and driven. On that uh, quite a hopeful and inspirational note of high ownership that is truly community led. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ikesho Kumar and Ms. Pallavi for joining us, for, for, for taking your time out to join us today at the Nash Forum Global Edition. Thank you so much for your time.